Good morning, Life Point. Let's stand to our feet this morning as we sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
joy and peace for the weary heart. Lift up your heads for your King has come. Sing for the light overwhelms the dark. Glory shining for all to see. Hope alive, let the gospel ring. God has made a way, He will have the praise. Tell the world His name is Jesus. Tell the world His name is Jesus. Tell the world His name is Jesus. Amen. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him. Room, you say, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven.
joy to the world. We will sing, sing, sing. Joy to the world. We can say joy to the world, joy to the world, it may not feel like it, but joy to the world, how great is our God. here we declare how great he is how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all we'll see how great how great is our God there's no other name like him you're the name
God's a promise. we declare and we say joy to the world Jesus you have come and we stand here today waiting for your second coming joy to the world so God today we know that there are people with many different stories going through many different things and what we do know is that the world is evil and it comes against your people And so, Lord God, I pray that today you would just empower our brothers and sisters here today. God, if there's anyone here in this room who does not believe in you, like has been a skeptic and has had questions, I pray that God today, Jesus, you would meet them today and that they would be saved. I pray very specifically today that people in this room who do not believe in Jesus, that they would be saved this very day. That would be the greatest present of all better than a bicycle or a Red Ryder BB gun. God, we want salvation. Jesus, would you move today? We give you glory and praise. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Church, you may be seated. Okay, we're going to read some scripture today, uh, starting with Luke chapter 1, verse 39 till 45. In those days... Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now I'm going to light up the joy candle. Well, good morning, Life Point. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us today. Uh, perhaps you remember Milan. Uh, he was on our video for one day just a few weeks ago. He is from our Brussels campus. Uh, he came into our, our, our campus there and uh, didn't know the Lord, and he got, God saved him, and uh, he actually got two things when he came. Uh, his girlfriend invited him, who's now his wife, so he got salvation and a wife. So how about that? That's pretty cool. So, uh, but uh, he is, and his wife are now in uh, the States, and they're in Wisconsin at Bible College studying so that they can preach and teach the gospel. And so, I, man, that's just an amazing thing. And I wanted you to, we're so glad he's here with us for Christmas uh, because uh, it's just a beautiful thing to let you know, like, this is what your one day offerings and your, when you tithe, this is what it goes to and you're changing the world. I mean, here you got a, a, a young man that didn't know the Lord, now knows the Lord, but he's gonna preach the gospel so many more people know the Lord. So it just keeps going. So thank you for being generous, Life Point. Thank you for giving to one day. We wanna ask you to continue to give uh, to that. That's above and beyond your tithe and continue to tithe, and, and uh, you can tithe by multiple different ways. If you're watching online, you can tithe online at lifepointchurch.org, uh, on our app, on our, our website. Uh, you can text to give. You can mail it in, bring it in, uh, uh, give it in the boxes here if you're in the room. Either way, uh, we would ask you to do it like uh, Amy and I do, and that's just if you've got a consistent salary, set it up to where it comes out every week and honors the Lord. It's good for you. It's good for the church. And so thank you for being generous. You're seeing the fruits of that, and we're so happy to have Milan and his wife here for a few days and so glad he could read scripture uh, for you today. Uh, We also want to uh, welcome all of you. And if you are uh, here 
watching from anywhere around the world are in, in the house. We, we're glad you're here. We don't want you to remain a visitor. We want you to become part of our family. So uh, we would love to, to, to know that you're here with us. If you've never filled out a card, please do so. If you're online, you can text the word CONNECT. Uh, to the number on the screen. You can do that in the house or you can fill out a card that will let us know you're here. Help us begin the journey, man. We'll, we'll tell you anything you wanna know. We'll open the closets, uh, let you see anything you wanna see and tell you anything you wanna know to help you uh, know who we are so that you can become a part of our family. So thank you for being here. Let me remind you that Christmas Eve is Saturday. Can you believe that? It just flies by, but Christmas Eve is Saturday. Uh, and we have uh, two Christmas Eve services uh, that afternoon. And we want to invite you to come and bring someone with you and let's celebrate uh, the birth of our Savior together. We'll do communion, invite uh, people uh, in your, your neighbors, your family. This is an easy invite. Uh, it's about an hour long, uh, perhaps. We know you got stuff to do. We know you got celebrations. And if you don't have one that night, you're preparing for one the next day. So uh, we are, uh, we, we, it's about an hour long. Come and, and worship with us, celebrate with us. Take time to focus on what this is all about on Christmas Eve. Then on Sunday, uh, they, I, I'm sorry, that's Friday night. I said Saturday. It's Christmas Day, su- Saturday. So that's Friday. Don't show up Saturday. That's Christmas Day. Uh, the 26th on Sunday, next Sunday, a week from today, we're going to have one service that day at 1045, okay? Uh, so uh, you come at 1045, worship with us, and, and we just we want you to know what's going on, okay? So uh, we're, we're, we're glad you're here. Thank you for being here, and uh, uh, let us know you're here as, uh, as, so that we can know who you are, and come on, be with us on Christmas, all right? So, man, we're, it's in Christmas crunch time here. You know, I mean, just a few short days and the halls will be undecked. Uh, the Christmas trees and all the lights will be go back up in the attic and all the songs that we love, well, they'll come off of the airwaves and, and off of our playlist. And you know what? That's welcome news for some of you because some people just don't like Christmas music. And I never really understood that. I'm like, you don't like Christmas music? What is that all about? And so, uh, but I know that, uh, you know, Jingle Bells is sort of a trigger for some of you, right? Because uh, it brings back some things you'd rather not remember. Uh, but uh, uh, for others like me, I hate to see Christmas music go, right? I love Christmas music. I love it so much, I start streaming it like November the 1st, early. As soon as it's like, man, bam, I start streaming Christmas music as soon as it's November uh, because I love it. it. It helps change my mood. It helps get me through the stuff. I mean, for instance, you know, when I'm, I, I sit in traffic bumper to bumper, you do around here a lot. And when I sit in bumper to bumper traffic, typically I get a little riled up. I get a little, I, you know, I talk to people, maybe say some things I shouldn't say, all those kind of things like you do. But you know, when, when I'm in bumper to bumper traffic and Mariah's on, you know, it sort of just helps me stay in the mood, right? It, it changes my spirit a little bit. Or when I've had a bad day at work or things at home, you know, one of my kids goes off the rail at home. And you know what I'm talking about if you're a parent. When something happening at home, you know, uh, some good friends like Bing Crosby and Michael Buble, they just help me stay in the spirit, right? And so I love Christmas music, uh, and, uh, uh, but it, it's, it's, about, it's about gone, right? But they don't just, the reason I love them is they don't just change our mood. They change our focus, now, I'm not talking about grandma got run over by a reindeer or, you know, Santa baby or last Christmas or by wham. I'm, I'm talking about, uh, you know, uh, great Christmas anthems of our faith like Silent Night, Oh Come All Ye Faithful, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. You see, these songs, they're anthems of our faith and, and, and what they do is, is they, they don't just change our mood, they change our focus. Uh, they help us re- remember that Christmas is not about something under the tree. It's about what's in a manger. They, they help us uh, get our heads out of our stockings and onto Jesus, right? And onto our Savior. I mean, these anthems of our faith that we sing during this season are, are great because, you know, our news media and our social media feeds, man, they lead us to, wor- to worry, Right? Well, these anthems of our faith lead us to worship. And so they're so incredible. And today we're going to look at a Christmas song as we continue our Christmas series called O Come All You Faithful. We're calling the, the church, the faithful, to come and adore Jesus. And we do that every year in Christmas in December with what we call our Advent series, which is something that's been done for hundreds of thousands of years in the church as we light candles the hope candle, the peace candle, the joy candle. Uh, and uh, I forget which one I said, hope, joy peace, love. So uh, as we light all those candles, we do that as a symbol of Jesus, the light of the world, and the Christ candle on Christmas Eve, Jesus, the light of the world coming into the world. And as we do that, we've already talked about Jesus, our love, Jesus, our peace, 
Jesus our hope. Today we're gonna talk about Jesus our joy. And as we do that, we're going to look at what I think is one of the greatest Christmas songs ever written, uh, but most of the world has never heard it. It's, it's a Christmas song that you won't find on iTunes. You won't find it on Spotify. Uh, it, it is not going to be on the playlist at your ugly sweater Christmas party, or it's not in uh, on the soundtrack of your favorite Christmas movie, whether that's Christmas Vacation or whatever. Uh, it, it's a song that's written by Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, after she found out that a virgin would give birth. So let me let me read it. Uh, to you. Uh, Let's read it together. I'll I'll read it and you can follow along. It's in Luke chapter one, verses 46 through 55. Milan read uh, the passage where uh, Elizabeth, remember Elizabeth was Mary's relative. Uh, Mary is told that she is going to give birth and and have a son. Elizabeth is told that she's going to, uh, her husband Zachariah is told that they're going, in her old age, going to have a son. They were barren, and, and he was gonna be Jesus' cousin, uh, JB. We call him John the Baptist. Uh, he would lead the way, prepare the way for Jesus. And so when Mary goes to visit her, because God tells Mary, the angel tells Mary that Elizabeth is pregnant. They're, they don't live in the same town. They didn't have uh, uh, cell phones and, and, and you know telephones and email and all these kinds of things, so she couldn't text her. So she goes to visit her, that's what Milan read. And then when Mary goes to visit her, we know that John the Baptist was in the womb of Elizabeth and he leaps for joy because Mary, Jesus is in her womb. Uh, when the, the Savior is in the presence, the baby leaps for joy. Life begins at conception. We see it right there. Beautiful example of that. And then after they exchange talk, after they talk, Mary's like, uh, this is so awesome, the this mother of my Savior, then this is how Mary responds. She breaks out into song, right? And this is her response, and it teaches us a lot about joy. So let's read it together. And Mary said, my soul magnifies. Hang on to that word, because it's important for this. This is what Mary's doing. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant, For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Now, this is a song that Mary sings uh, after receiving word from Gabriel that she, even though a virgin, would give birth to a son, not just any son. You see, like a lot of you ladies who've given birth to a son, Mary gave birth to a son, but her son was not like my mama's son, right? Her, her, her son was far from my mama's son. Uh, her, her son would be the literal uh, uh, son of God. Her son is God in the flesh, fully man, fully God. And so after Mary receives this news, she writes this song, or she not really, she bursts forth in this song. And so therefore, I think it's a great place for us to learn about joy, okay? So today, I hope you learn some things about joy and how to experience joy, even when you don't think it's possible, okay? And so, so now, uh, Mary, think about this. Mary is, is, is uh, it's an incredible honor, right? We think about that honor. It was an incredible honor for Mary to be told that, to be chosen from all the women, from Eve all the way through until now. Of all the women in the world, one woman was chosen to be the earthly mother of Jesus. One woman, Mary. That's a great honor. That's an incredible honor. But we think about the honor, but I want you to know it was also terrifying, right? It was also a a crisis, now, uh, let me help try to put you in Mary's Birkenstock, so to speak, all right? Let me, let me help put you there uh, so that you can, as I'm studying these passages, uh, I always, you know, there's so many way, you know, there's so many things that you have to do to really study a passage. You have to get down to the context. You have to know what's going on around, all these kind of things. And then if you try to put yourself literally in the, the sandals of Mary for just a moment, she's about a 14-ish year old girl. Now, I want you to hang on to that. that that's amazing. I mean, she's not, we're not talking about a 20 or a 30 year old woman. We're talking about a, a teenage girl, early teenage girl, 14 ish, maybe younger. That's her age. 
and she is betrothed. It's in the most happy time of her life, really. She is betrothed to the man of her dreams. She's betrothed to the man, a man named Joseph, right? Now, we've talked about this, but a betrothal, much different than our engagement. It's like, but unlike. Uh, their betrothal was binding. It was a marriage, basically, that you could only break legally with a divorce. So that's how binding this was. But in their betrothal period, they didn't consummate the wedding, the marriage. They didn't live together. The, the woman would live in her uh, home with her family. The, the groom would live with his family or get, be getting uh, the home ready that he would bring his bride into to live. And this was for a period of time. They were betrothed, legally married, but not yet consummated. Now, you're beginning to understand God's sovereignty in the exact time Jesus was born, that a man and woman would literally be married, but not yet have consummated their uh, marriage. It's an amazing, God's just awesome, right? When you think about all the little, the, the little things that revolve around this that we overlook so many times. So they're in this time, and Mary is an exciting time. You, 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 you ladies remember this if you're married, right? You remember the, how exciting that was leading up to your ceremony. Because what he would do when it come time for their ceremony, he would go to her house with a, 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 a wedding party, and he would pick her up, basically, and they would process a processional to their new house where they were gonna live, and then they would have ce- ceremony, celebrate, all this kind of stuff. And she's planning all this just like you ladies did. That's where her dreams were. She's planning the reception. What are we going to have? What are we going to have to eat? What are we going to have to drink? She's planning all this stuff. And then, uh, you know, she's, she's picking out colors for her home. And, and so she, it's it, the time of her life, the most exciting. You ladies remember that if you're married. It's the, one of the most exciting times of her life. And then Gabriel drops this bomb in her lap, Right? I mean, uh, her world just has been blown up, right? Because now, think about it, okay? Put yourself in her shoes. It's a great honor what, 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 what uh, Gabriel told her, and she accepted it. Great honor. But now think about also the emotions that she has. Think about w- the reality. Think about uh, what's going to happen in her life. You know as well as I know what's going through her mind is Joseph's about to hit eject out of this thing, right? I mean, this is her betrothed. He knows he has not known her biblically, right? He's not been with her. She's pregnant. You get pregnant one way, right? It's not in the water, right? So what's he going to do? He's not going to believe her. You would not believe her. I would not believe her. He's going to eject. Her parents are not going to believe her. They're going to never trust her again. The the community is going to talk about her. Her reputation is trash, she could have literally been dragged outside of the town, outside the city limits, and stoned to death because she would have been unfaithful to her husband. Okay, so think about all that. Her world's just been blown up. Great honor, but man, we're in crisis. I mean, she's got a lot to worry about. She's got a lot to consume her, just like you, right? I mean, man, just like you. I mean, we, we live in a world and you've got a lot to consume you. Some things that you've created uh, in your own doing and some things that we've created with our own decisions and some things that we have not created that's been created in our lives by other people's decisions, right? And you've got a lot to worry about. You've got a lot. So how do you have joy in the midst? That's why I think this, this is so great to help us understand joy. I think it's so great because Mary's world has just been blown up. All of her circumstances point to disaster, uh, you know, honor, but to disaster. And she's concerned, she's worried, she's nervous, all these kind of things. But that's not what we see. What we see is, 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 is joy. And I think that is what that makes this so uh, important a passage for us to learn what joy is. See, maybe you've heard from a pastor somewhere or read, uh, maybe you've heard me say, joy Biblical joy and happiness are different. We get that, right? Happiness is based on circumstances. Man, you get a raise at work, you're happy. (laughs) You get cut back at work, you're not happy. Your happiness is gone, right? I mean, your kids are making A's in school, you're happy. Man, your kids, you know, are failing school, you're not happy. Your marriage is great, you're happy. Your marriage is not great, you're not happy. Circumstances dictate your happiness. And maybe you've heard that joy uh, supersedes circumstances. Biblical joy is not circumstantially based. That's true. But if you're, if you're like me, uh, uh, that is true, but it also sounds just too good to be true, right? I mean, it sounds a little theory that's hard to be lived. Because you're, those of you who are believers know you've had stuff happen to you, right? I mean, you've had uh, life hit you. Life is sometimes a cruel 
a, a, a cruel, you know, a p- p- opponent, and it'll hit you right square in the mouth sometimes. And when you're hit with a left hook from life, uh, I mean, I, believers get hit with left hooks from life, right? You, so you get an uppercut every now and then. Things happen, and, and, and when that happens, I don't know a believer who's heard that his wife or her husband is having an affair or that their kids are off the rail or that they lost a child in miscarriage or that they got cut back at work or, or, or whatever. I've never heard a believer go, oh, that, it's that gone, that's just okay, I mean, I'm just, I can be happy. Let's just go out and celebrate tonight. I've never heard a believer do that. As a matter of fact, that's unreal, right? I mean, man, uh, you know, uh, about eight months ago, all of a sudden when my face, you know, on this side of my mouth, my, the, my right side of my face just sort of went, you know, limp and I couldn't feel anything and, uh, or, you know, and I couldn't move anything. And I'm thinking, man, you know, you made fun of me for six months, some of you, uh, uh, you know. I, I mean, I wasn't just like, oh yes, my face is up limp. My face is numb. I can't move my mouth. You would have thought, that dude has been drinking, I mean, the funny eggnog for a long time, right? He's been drinking eggnog out of that bowl, for the adult bowl for a long time. No, I wouldn't be genuine if I'd have done that, man. I, I mean, that was, I wasn't happy about that, right? You're not happy when things happen. You're not going to be happy, but that's not what, that's not what joy is. I want to help you to understand it. Many of you have experienced joy, and you don't even realize you've experienced joy because here's what joy is. Joy doesn't mean, it's not the absence of bad circumstances. It's not the absence of, of emotion. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not that. Here's what joy is. Happiness comes and goes with circumstances, but joy is not based on circumstances, and it's not based on emotion. It's a confidence in the midst of any circumstance that God's in control. That's what joy is. You see, those who don't believe in Jesus don't have that. Right, when life hits those who don't believe in Jesus in the mouth, you know what it's called? Random. It means nothing. What's it for? I don't know. What does it mean? Nothing. Because life stinks and then you die and it's cruel in between. And, and, you know, and so nothing means nothing, right? But for the believer, when anything bad happens, your wife or your husband get hit by a drunk driver and I'm gonna, if that were to happen to me, I would hate it. I would be angry. I would want somebody to pay because I believe in justice. But here's what I would know. Nothing is not nothing. Everything has purpose and meaning. Even though I may not know it, I have confidence in my Lord. So I'm not gonna be happy if that happens, but you know what I am gonna be? I'm gonna be confident that God's in control. It's not gonna destroy me or steal my joy in the Lord. That's what joy is. It's a confidence in the Lord. That's what we see Mary have, right? We see, we see Mary have this. And so I, I, how did she have this? Well, I wanna look at three ways that she had it because I wanna help you have it. I want to help you have this because life has hit you and life's going to hit you over and over and over. And how can you have this? I want to look at three ways. One, Mary looked back at the work of God. She looked up to the person of God and she looked forward to the promise of God. And and let let me help you with that. First off, let's see how she had joy in looking back. Throughout history, this psalm, this song that Mary sung has been called the Magnificat, right? You've heard that, maybe. Perhaps it is a Latin word that means magnify. That's why I told you to hang on to that word, magnify. It's a Latin word that means to magnify. That's what Mary's doing. She's magnifying God. Now, when you magnify something, you bring it into view. You bring it into focus so that it can be seen for what it is. That's really what you do. For instance, uh, many of you have looked through a telescope, right? Probably all of you have looked through a telescope at some point in your life. Uh, I mean, me, I, if you look at the stars and see, I, I, where I grew up, it's, it's, it's great. A lot of great things about where I grew up. I know I grew up in Appalachian Mountains. Some of you think I'm a country bumpkin, and I am, and I'm proud of it. It's who I am, all right? So, uh, uh, but I grew up in Appalachian But here's a great thing, man. I, when I looked at the sky and the stars, it's a whole lot different than you look at the sky and the stars around here or anywhere else because there's no there's no light pollution, right? And so therefore, man, you can see the sky and it's beautiful. And you see all these stars and all these comets and you go look at them today and you know what they look like? They look like a little white dot in the sky. That's all they, what's a white dot in the sky? And you can start naming stars. But here's what happens. You put a, a, a telescope, especially a really good telescope, and you look at the stars and they become different. You look at a comet and you look at a comet under a telescope that looks like a white dot just maybe moving, and then under that, in that telescope, you can begin to see, wow, the beauty and the, the majesty of that comet. You begin to see dust and ice and colors, and it's moving at a rapid speed, and it's amazing, right? That's what a telescope does. It magnifies it. Now, it doesn't make that comet something it's not. It lets you see that comet for something it is. 
It lets you see it for what it is. That's what Mary's doing. She's praising God for who he is in the midst of all these confusing circumstances that might rack her life in an unbelievable way. She's praising God for who he is. She's magnifying him. You see what our default is and what most of us have the opera, all of us, our default is to magnify ourselves, not God. And when we magnify ourselves, that's a, that's a sure recipe for misery. But when we magnify God, that leads to joy. We, can, we magnify ourselves and no matter what the circumstances are, how good they are, it leads to misery. We magnify God and no matter how bad they are, it leads to joy, right? And so, so we learn here from Mary that, that looking back, looking back to see uh, who, who God really is and magnifying him and exalting him. That's where joy begins. Now, we see that she looks back, and what does she do? She begins to remember the works of God. She begins to remember, and she begins to recount how he has, uh, how he has fed, filled the hungry, and he's made the rich empty, how he has brought the high low, and how he has, uh, uh, how he has elevated the, those in humble estate. She begins to remember his mercy. She begins to remember the promises that he made to the Old Testament fathers, and how he's a faithful promise keeper, and he never breaks a promise. She begins to remember all these things, and as she's remembering in song, she begins to remember this, in the midst of, uh, of all this, she has joy. She has joy. She doesn't know what Joseph's gonna do, but she knows what God's gonna do. She doesn't know what her mom and dad are gonna do or what they're gonna think, but she knows what God's gonna do and what God thinks. She doesn't know if her reputation's ever gonna be restored, but she knows that God is the God who restores. She knows what God has done, and in the midst of all of this, she has joy because she knows what God has done, right? Now, how did she do this? You see, that's a question that I have. She's 14-ish years old. 14-ish year old. How does a girl who is a young teenager, maybe younger than 14, how does she have this kind of, of, of maturity uh, how does she have this kind of spirituality to, to, to look back at what God has done and to have joy in the midst of these circumstances? It's a great question. Thank you for asking. Here's what I believe. Here's what I believe. She lived in a world much different than ours. Jo Mary was a Jewish girl, and discipling their kids was no joke for Jewish parents. Okay, discipling their kids was not an option for the Jewish parents. Discipling their kids was not something that they left to the church to do, they left to the youth pastor to do, or to the children's pastor. That, that was not something that they overlooked. That was something that they took very seriously. You see, in their home in that day, they didn't have a Bible. I've got tons of Bibles in my home. I mean, man, I've got probably more Bibles than most because it's sort of what I do for a living and I love translation and I love Bibles. I've got a lot of Bibles in my home, in my office. I've got, I've got I don't know how many Bibles in my pocket, right? I mean, right now on my phone, uh, different translations and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you've got a lot of Bibles in your home probably. If you don't have a Bible, we'll give you a free one if you'll come and see us. Somebody come back last week and said, hey, I don't have a Bible. Can I have a Bible? You bet, right? So, but you've probably got a lot of Bibles in your home. You know, they didn't have a Bible home. Remember, they didn't have the printing press. They didn't have phones in their pockets with digital copies of anything. They didn't have a printing press. Uh, they had the Old Testament. They were living the New Testament. They didn't have the New Testament yet, but they did have the scrolls. And every scroll, remember, had to be meticulously copied by a scribe and all these rules to make sure it was there. And so uh, homes didn't have scrolls. There may have been one copy of a scroll in, in cities, and this was a small town, so, and they may, there may have been one copy, and it would have been in the synagogue, the local synagogue, in what would they call the Torah room. It was a special room in the synagogue where they kept the scrolls. And uh, they would meet every Sabbath, every Saturday, they would meet together, they would guarantee they were going to corporate worship. Uh, nothing was keeping them unless they were extremely sick. Uh, they were going to corporate worship and they were going to be reading together from the scrolls. The rabbi would take the scrolls and he would read the scrolls and he would expound the scrolls, much like what we do today. That's why we do what we do today, right? But then they would talk about the, 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 the scrolls, the, the scriptures. They would memorize the scriptures. They would tell stories from the scriptures. And this is how they passed it down to their kids because they didn't go home and have one. When Mary got up on, in the morning, she didn't open a scroll and start having her quiet time, taking notes. That's not what she did. How did she know 
the stories because her mom and dad poured them into her heart. That's how she knew them. How did she know about Abraham? And how did she know, because she knew the story of Abraham. She knew the story of how Abraham and his wife Sarah, they were old and they were well advanced in years and they were well beyond childbearing years. And yet God gave him a son named Isaac and he made a promise through, through him that all the world, through Abraham, that all the worlds would be blessed, all the peoples would be blessed, but he didn't have a son, he gave him Isaac. But then he told Abraham to go sacrifice Isaac. Didn't make sense nor does a virgin having a baby make sense. Not, nor does a 100-year-old woman having a baby make sense. But she knew the story. She knew the story of God telling Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Didn't make sense. Didn't make sense. But Abraham did exactly what God told him to do, and then God provided. And I, I, she knew these stories of miracle. She knew these stories of God's provision, right? You can bet she knew the story of Esther, how as a young lady, she would have probably just loved the story of Esther, how God used a woman. She would have known that story. And I mean, she would have known these stories. How did she know these stories? Because discipling their kids was no joke for a Jewish parent. And they would have poured these stories into her heart and into her head over and over and over and over. Let me pour the scripture into your heart and into your head. And they did it over and over and over and over. And she knew the stories. She had it in her heart, she had it in her head. And so when faced with a crisis, where did she turn? To what she had in her heart and her head? What did she have in her heart and her head? She had God's word in her heart and she had God's word in her head because her parents poured it there. Wonder what she would have had in her heart and head today. Hopefully she would have had scripture. I hope our teenagers have scripture. I hope you have scripture in her heart and head. What she would have had in her heart and her head today. You know, most teenagers today, most adults today, we got TikTok in our heart and our head. We've got Instagram in our heart and head. Man, we've got uh, the music that we listen to in our heart and head. And if Mary today would have had TikTok in her heart and in her head, you know what she would have done? When God told her that she would have, if she had had TikTok in her heart and head, she would have probably went to Planned Parenthood. That's probably where she would have went because that's what filled her heart. That's what filled her head. But God's word in her heart and her head. And therefore, what did she do? She went to Bethlehem. She went the distance. Even though it didn't make sense and even though it was crazy. And in the midst of it, she had joy because she had confidence in the Lord. She had confidence in the Lord. Parents, please don't underestimate the importance of you discipling your kids. You want your kids to, 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 to succeed in life. Every parent does. And I pray every day, God, please pour God into your kids. Please pour his word into your kids. Please pour his word into their heart. Man, we, we, we try to provide the, 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 the uh, Advent uh, book so that you can do that once a week and then even after it's over. Uh, we're going to do a, we, we did a yearly and annual uh, Bible reading this year. And I know it was a lot of reading, man. It was a lot. Some of you tuckered out. Some of you tuckered out early. Some of you tuckered out later. And if you did, don't feel bad. I've tuckered out on many of them too, okay? It's okay. But here's what we're going to do. In January 1st, we're going to start a new one. And it's going to be New Testament only. We're going to read the New Testament through together next year. So it's going to be a whole lot less uh, uh, reading uh, so that, uh, you know, to help you get the head, word in your heart and in your head. Start pouring these things into your kids. And so Mary, uh, you know, uh, 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 they poured the, the word in her head. They had poured Isaiah into her head, the prophet. And you know, Isaiah, the prophet, uh, had prophesied about a virgin giving birth. And she knew that, that, that God would provide a savior for her people, not just from a military oppression, but from a spiritual oppression. She knew this, and she knew that the prophet uh, prophesied that a virgin would be with birth and uh, that a virgin would give birth to a child. And so she knew, this is me. I am getting the privilege of giving birth to the savior of the world. Not just to the world, but her own savior. You see, I, the reason I say her own savior is because that's fighting words to Catholics. You know, because Catholics, some of you come from a Catholic background and Catholics don't believe Mary needed a savior. Roman Catholics believe that Mary was immaculate, that she was perfect. Some believe that she even ascended to heaven and many pray to Mary, right? I mean, you, Mary, mother of God, I mean, you pray, many Catholics pray to Mary because, you know, what's the surest way to get a boy to do something is to go through his mama, right? I guess Catholics are trying to go through Jesus' mama and so they pray to Mary thinking Mary will, you know, bend the ear of Jesus, do something for us. And, and I want you to understand that that is absolutely not in the Bible. It's myth, it's, 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 it's tradition, it's mythology, it's, it's, it's a lot of things. And let me tell you what it is, at, at the core, it's idol worship. It's ungodly and it's unbiblical, it's idol worship. Because it's so far from the Bible. Mary knew that she was broken and needed a savior. 
She knew that she was broken and she needed a savior. And, and, and like Mary, we would all have more joy. Like Mary, we would all have more joy if we look back at what God has done. And then we could, in the midst of our circumstance, we could have confidence in what God will do. We would all have more joy if we reflected on our salvation on our need for salvation, and that God provided a savior, we would all have more joy if we look back. Now, let's look at how she found joy in looking up. Not only did she find joy in looking back at the work of God, but in looking up at the person of God, right? Uh, and who God is. Uh, she, she, notice she begins to sing, and she sings about the attributes of God. She sings about his mercy, and about his power, and about his sovereignty, and, and about his greatness, and she, she begins, uh, his justice, she begins to sing about all these attributes of God. And, and, and here's what she's doing. Here's what she's doing. Her life's in a mess, right? Her life is a mess. We, we don't think about her life being in a mess as much as we think about, man, oh, she's getting ready to, she's got the privilege of, of, of bringing the, the son of God into the world. We, we don't necessarily think, man, her husband's probably gonna leave her. Her, mom's not, her mom and dad are not gonna believe her. Her, 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 tra- her reputation's trash, all these things. She's in a mess. And what do we do when we get in a mess? Many times when we're in a mess, we put our eyes all over that mess. That's where our focus is, right? We focus on the mess. Man, this happened to me. I lost my job. I don't know how I'm gonna pay the bills. I don't know how I'm gonna provide Christmas. I don't know what we're gonna do. I've got to, and then, you know, we, we, this happens and I don't know how I'm gonna fix this. My kids rebel. I don't know how to, my eyes are on that. I don't know how to fix this, right? Or we begin to put our eyes on things that we think will give us, uh, you know, joy. You know, we, we look under the tree and we think that package under the tree uh, will give us joy, Right? And, uh, or that car, or the thing. And I don't know if you know this or not, but sometimes what you think you're going to get for Christmas, you're, you're not going to get it anyway, right? You're going to be let down. Uh, and if you do, and you think, oh, that's going to give me joy, I, I can't wait till I get that. That's going to give me joy. And it, it might for just, and it, the new wears off, right? And it's not going to quite deliver what you thought it's going to deliver. Right, that new job that that'll bring me joy. That new relationship, if I get married, that'll bring me joy. See, we got our eyes out on all of our bad mess, or on what the things we think will solve the mess. And that's not what Mary had. Mary, we don't see anywhere in Scripture she was going. Joseph might leave me. What do I got to do, man? I got to be calling him. I got to be talking to him. I got to be, man. I got to just be all over Joseph. I, I, my, my friends are going to talk about me. I got to get ahead of this. I've got to get out here. My mom and dad are not going to believe. We don't see that. What does she do? She don't have her eyes out here on any of that. She has her eyes on God. That's what her focus is. Her focus is not her mess. It, it, her eyes are on God, and and her joy absolutely comes through because of it. She looks back at what God's done and she looks up at who God is. I know who God is. I know that God has told me this and it's his plan. And so therefore, I'm gonna let God take care of it because he's mighty. He's sovereign. He's merciful. I know who he is. John Piper, I love this quote from John Piper. It says this, the single biggest threat to our joy. So he's gonna tell us the single biggest threat to our joy. What would you think the single biggest threat to your joy is? Well, any kind of circumstance that takes away from you something that you think gives you joy or doesn't let you get joy, any kind of circumstance, right? Your despair, that's the greatest threat to your joy. That's what we would think. Here's what Piper says. The single biggest threat to our joy is not disappointment or despair, but a forgetfulness and distraction. We forget who God is. We forget what God's done. We're distracted from whom God is. We're distracted from what God has done. And then we, we begin to put our eyes on the mess around us and we begin to put our eyes on the things we think will bring us joy in the midst of that mess rather than having our eyes focused on God, right? And so, so we look for joy and in, in, in our, in our eyes are on completely focused on the wrong things. Like Mary, we'd all have a lot more joy if we looked up to God and who he is rather than out at the mess that we're in or the circumstances or the things that we think will provide the joy, rather than looking to God, who is the only source of true joy. And then, not only did she look back, do we find that Mary looked back at the work of God, and that allowed her to go, okay, God, I know what you've done. I know it didn't make sense for Abraham. It doesn't make sense now. I know you provide for Abraham. I know you're gonna provide for me. Not only did she look up and say, God, I I don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't have to. You're powerful. You're mighty. You're sovereign. You're in control. I don't know what I'm gonna do about my reputation, but God, you can stop wagging lips. 
God, I don't know if Joseph's gonna stay, but I know you can change his heart to stay because I know you're powerful. I know who you are, God. But then she, she not only looked back to the work of God and up to the person of God, she looked forward to the promise of God. She looked forward to the promise of God. Look at the last two verses in the song with me again. Here, here's, what she, here's what she says. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Mary wraps up the song by singing about the covenant promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 12. This covenant promise, she wraps it up. And then what did she say? He has helped. Notice it's present tense. It's not past tense. He didn't, you know, it wasn't something he did. It's something that he is doing Why? Because God promised it. And when God promises something, the prophets spoke as prophecy sometimes in present tense. Why? Because it was guaranteed to happen. It was guaranteed to happen, right? She had no doubt in what God had done. She had no doubt in who God was and she had no doubt in what God would do, right? Mary knew his word. She knew God's character. She knew God's heart. And therefore, she knew that he would be faithful to his promise, That's why studying the Bible is so important, folks. That's why coming to corporate worship like this is so important or in small group. That's why it's so important to do these things because we want to pour God into your head. We want to pour God's word into your head and into your heart. We want you to pour God's word into your head and into your heart. That's why it's important for you daily to be in God's word because the world is coming after you. The world is attacking you especially if you're a believer, the world is going to eat you for lunch. As a matter of fact, we're told in scripture that the enemy is like a roaring lion, prowling, roaming, looking for whomever he may devour. And you're going to be devoured in this world if you don't don't have your feet planted on a solid foundation. You're gonna be devoured. Your kids are gonna be devoured. Your kids are gonna be devoured if the music they listen to and the, the, the social media platform if that is what feeds them and if that's where they, they get their info, they're gonna be devoured in this world. The greatest thing that you can do is you yourself as, a, as, as, as an individual, as a single, as a mom, dad, as a husband, wife, is, is to pour the word into your heart and into your head and pour it into your wife's heart, your husband's heart, pour it into your kid's heart, into their head. That's the greatest single thing that you can do because life's gonna hit them. You know that. You know this is a cruel world we live in. Life's gonna hit them and life's gonna hit you. And the greatest thing that you can do is be prepared. And how do you prepare? Pour God's word into your heart and your head. Come together to corporate worship so that we can remember who, what God has done. We can remember who he is and we can remember the promise he's made and we can look forward knowing that, listen, I know who God is. And the world looks out of control. You see, that's why there's so much tension in our world right now. The world looks out of control and no one seems to know the answers But we as believers, we should be very optimistic in this world because we know who holds it. We should be very optimistic because we've got something the rest of the world doesn't have. We've got the promise of God and we know who God is. And so therefore that should change how we interact with our world and how we interact with those in our world, right? It should mean that we don't lose hope. We don't let a disease or a pandemic cause us to lose hope. We don't let social unrest cause us to lose hope and forget who God is and and begin to flock to the answers of the world and the answers of the world are digging the hole deeper and man, they're, they're almost done with the depth of the grave. Now it's almost covering it up. See, that's where we turn when we don't know God. We gotta keep our eyes on God. Keep our eyes on the Lord. We know who he, what he's done. We know who he is and we know what he's going to do and I'll promise when life hits you, it will. Here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna, be, you're gonna be nervous. Man, circumstances are gonna hit you. And when they do, you're gonna be nervous. You're gonna be confused sometimes. You're gonna be angry sometimes, right? I mean, Jesus had emotion. Jesus wept, remember, when his friend died. That's okay. Doesn't mean happiness and joy. It's like, well, you don't have to be happy when something happens. But in that, you've got confidence that God's in control and it doesn't destroy you. Sometimes we're shaken, but we're not destroyed. That's what joy is. Joy is realizing, I don't have to control this. God is in control. And today, if you don't know Jesus, 
I would invite you to give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ. He's the only, only way for you to experience true peace in a chaotic world, true hope in a hopeless world, true love in a world of hate, and true joy in a world that's trying to steal every bit of joy you have. Jesus is the only way. And if you don't know him today, would you text the word Jesus to the number on the screen? If you're watching online in the house, come back to the Connect booth and tell somebody, I, I wanna know Jesus. Man, I, I'm just, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired and I wanna know Jesus. Would you do that today? If you do know Jesus, then I would ask you today to begin to look at Mary through this season and say, you know what, I, I, I wanna make sure that, that I use Mary. And you see, unlike we, sometimes Protestants, they think too low of Mary. Catholics think way too high of Mary. Uh, I, I mean, as far as not think way too high, but they elevate her to a place of deity. And, and, and we don't do either, man. We, need to, we, uh, we hold her in high regard, right? But here's what we need to do. We need to learn from her example. Learn from her example. And let's learn from her example. And let's say, okay, man, we, we, we're all rattled a little bit in our world right now. Let's continue looking back to what God has done. Let's look up to who he is. Let's remember what he's done and see how big of a difference it makes in your life. And the way you start that is getting the word every day and getting in church every week. That's the way you start that. Believer, let's, let's make next year a completely different year. In our minds, we can't, we have no control over uh, a pandemic and we have no control over uh, a, a decisions and social unrest. We have no, but we have control over how we respond and what we do. Let's make this year different by getting in the word, by getting in church, by looking back to God, uh, what God has done, who, up to who he is and forward to what he promised. And I promise your life will change. Your life will change. It's not gonna take all those things away. Right? I mean, the disciples were killed. He's not gonna take your hardships away. As a matter of fact, they might be more because the world hates you if you're a Christian, to be quite honest. Christian, Christians are the most oppressed people group in the world. The world hates you if you're a Christian. The world's coming after Christians. So it doesn't mean, oh, everything's going away. Your life will be harder at work, right? Your life will be harder at school. I mean, it'll be, it'll be like chaos sometimes. But we look back, we look up, we look forward and see what God does. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for your amazing love. Thank you for your amazing peace, your amazing hope, and your amazing joy. And I pray that as we have went through this Advent season leading up to Christmas Day next weekend, God, we just pray that we would experience and understand that you, Jesus, are our hope. You, Jesus, are our joy. You, Jesus, are our peace. You, Jesus, are our love. I pray for people that don't know you. I pray that you would open their eyes to see who you are. I pray that you would convict Holy Spirit people today, Lord, and I pray that anyone who doesn't know you that's listening, anyone who doesn't know you that's watching and in this room today, I pray that today they would be convicted if they don't know you, they would begin to see that you are truly their only hope for hope and peace and joy and love and salvation, and I pray that you would save souls today. God, I pray for the believer in the room. I pray that we would know we don't have to be like cattle that's lined up and, and, and just led to slaughter. God, we too can have hope and we can, we can in a world, we can, we, we've got a beacon of light that guides us. God, we've got a foundation that gives us hope and joy and love and peace in a crazy messed up world. And I pray that God, we as believers would begin to live different. We would engage the world different. Lord, we would think different. Lord, and, and we would not keep our eyes on the mess, but Lord, we would keep our eyes on Christ. And Lord, we would have hope that we would look back continually and remember what you've done. We would look up and remember who you are. We would look forward and we would remember your promise, knowing that you're faithful and you will keep it. And it would change our lives and it would change how we live. It would change our families. It would change our churches, churches and it would change our communities. And it would change our country. Lord, we love you and praise you and thank you for your grace in Jesus' name, amen.